Um, so I thought just really briefly first, we just have um, a very brief run over of where we're at with climate change. And I'll do this very briefly. Um, there we are. So where are we at with climate change? Um, in summary, as I'm sure you're all aware, we're really not in a good place when it comes to climate change. I think this graph shows this really nicely. So what this graph is showing is uh, the amount of CO2, which is the main greenhouse gas we've got in the atmosphere over the last 60 years, so from 1963 to today. And you can see two things on here. So first you can see that for the last 60 years we have continued to be putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and this curve is continually rising and as that rises the temperature rises with it. Um, and I think the second thing you can see is particularly if we look from about 1990 onwards, that's an important point because from 1990 onwards we've had uh, well-established scientific evidence that climate change is happening, that humans are the cause of it, and that we need to tackle this. So from uh, 1988, when James Hansen uh, testified to the US Senate, from then onwards, you know, we've, we've understood the reality of climate change. And so this really, these last 30 years give us a sense of how well we've done in the last 30 years and acting on that knowledge. Um, and as you can see, despite a range of events that have happened in the last 30 years, some of which are very positive, you know, uh, 1991, the forming of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the overall multilateral agreement under the UN that um, parties sign up to to tackle climate change together. Despite a range of particular meetings, most notably uh, COP21 in 2015 at Paris, where we've got the Paris Agreement, but also other meetings in Kyoto, Copenhagen, Berlin. And it was, despite all of these positive interventions, and despite some other very significant global events, such as the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, nothing has really changed. We are continuing to put huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if anything, the rate at which we're putting it in is growing and this curve is accelerating. So we're not doing very well. And why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because what do we need to do now? So this, this is a, an, another, another, I think, really important figure. So this figure shows um, historical emissions in black. So this is emissions uh, for fossil, from burning fossil fuels, again, over those last 30 years since the sort of late 1980s. Um, and the issue is that um, because we've delayed and done so little on climate change in the last 30 years, we have to do something really monumental now if we want to stay within 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees, which are the two main temperature thresholds that we talk about in climate change. And really any world that has warmed more than two degrees is gonna have some really pretty horrific and catastrophic impacts. And it's really essential that we keep the temperature below two degrees and towards 1.5 degrees. But what you see in this picture in these different curves is that because we've delayed over the last 30 years, we have a really monumental task ahead of us now. Um, seeing the grey line, you know, even if we start tackling climate change today in the 2020s, we're going to have to bend the emissions curve so rapidly if we want to stay within 1.5 degrees. And the tragic thing is if we'd started in 2000, looking at those blue lines, we'd have been able to cut emissions at a much slower rate while still remaining within the overall temperature target. But because we've burnt up so much of our emissions space in the atmosphere, we have to tackle things really quickly now. And so you know, the picture of where we're at and what needs to happen is that now we need really aggressive and transformative action because we've had 30 years of delay and insufficient action. And so I guess the question that I want to address today is, well, why? Why is that the case? Why have we known about climate change for 30 years? We've known the causes and we've known the solutions, but we've not been able to act. Um, and I, my hypothesis, what I want to talk about today is that a lot of this has been due to these narratives of delay, uh, these discourses of delay that have um, hampered climate action in a range of places and have been perpetuated by vested interests um, who don't want to tackle climate change because that will uh, impact on their power in society. So let's just talk about these. So um, hopefully as you're reading in your allotted reading space, discourses of de delay are these discourses which they accept that climate change is happening you know, I think we've moved beyond an era where climate denial has significant power. Um, for example, you know, certainly in the UK, in the UK Parliament, there's maybe sort of five or six MPs who still don't really accept the existence of climate change. Very small, you know, about 1%, and they stay very quiet these days. Um, we've moved beyond the stage of climate denial 
but we still have discourses which accept that climate change is happening, but still justify inaction or inadequate efforts. Um, and they focus on a range of things, and they focus on either that we just need minimal action or that others should be taking the action. Um, and they focus on the negative effects of climate policy, and they, they raise doubt that mitigation is possible. Um, and I think the, the difficulty with these discourses is that all of them have the ring of truth about them, and they have something in them which is true and which is fair. But the way that they then build a narrative around reality uh, is deeply damaging and uh, yeah, deeply counterproductive. So um, we're just going to spin through some of these discourses that you'll have been reading about. And I just want to share a few further facts about them and, and thoughts. Um, and once we've done that, we'll have a bit of a think about what it is that we might be able to do as individuals and as citizens and as a society to tackle these discourses of delay and to confront them. Um, we're not going to go through all of them now because uh, I want to make sure there's space for discussion and I think some of them are more relevant to our context, uh, particularly the context that I'm familiar with, which is uh, the UK and parliamentary democracy in the UK. Um, but also, I think more broadly, the global level, some of these discourses are more important and more active at the moment than others. So we'll focus on those ones. So let's just dive into them. So first off, we've got these narratives which want to redirect responsibility away from um, anyone who is being called to take climate action, whether that's a company or government or um, yeah, another actor in society. Um, and the first of these narratives which we found was individualism. Um, and I think the, the, the narrative behind individualism, which people have been reading about, is this idea that um, at the heart of the climate crisis is consumers. And if only individuals could consume better, and if only individuals would tackle their own climate carbon footprint, then we'd be OK. Um, and this is obviously problematic because, first off, it denies any sort of systemic or structural dimension to the climate crisis. It, it focuses on individuals while ignoring the fact that actually, as individuals, our consumption patterns and the way we live are uh, deeply shaped by the systems that we live within, and whether that's just the physical infrastructure that we have, you know, in certain places it's completely impossible to live without a petrol vehicle at the moment because we don't have an alternative infrastructure that allows electric vehicles. And um, all the social systems that we live within that uh, reinforce uh, norms around excessive consumption through advertising, through uh, peer pressure and, and, and other, other actions there. Uh, but individual, the individualist narrative would deny that and would try and isolate us as individuals. I think also this individualist narrative paints a very negative picture of humanity. Um, you know, you hear quite often, uh, I certainly hear quite often, you know, oil companies, their CEO saying, oh, well, we'd love to not dig up more oil from the ground, but we can't help it because humanity demands it. And there's this sense that um, if only humans could demand less and if we could be less greedy, then we'd be able to uh, tackle this. And thirdly, I think this, this narrative is used quite effectively to disempower those who are calling for structural change. Certainly that's been my experience. Um, before I moved to London, I was quite involved in uh, a range of activism, both campaigning for divestment, so campaigning to, to pull uh, investments out of fossil fuel stocks, um, and also through Extinction Rebellion. Now, both movements which are calling for some level of structural change. Um, and so often the pushback we would get is, well, you're not perfect, you know, you still have a carbon footprint, you still use polluting products, um, and until you've got your own house in order as an individual, you, the, you've got no credence in calling for structural change, which, um, as I've said earlier, I think is, in, is deeply circular and deeply flawed, because actually as individuals in the society that we live in, our individual choices are quite heavily constrained by the structures that we exist within. Um, and so that's uh, a false, false dichotomy. So that's our first narrative, individualism. Um, second up, we've got a pair of narratives around whataboutism or free riding. So if we talk, talk about whataboutism first, I, I guess you know, at the heart of this narrative is the idea that climate action is futile or pointless because others aren't taking action. Um, and I think this can have a really toxic synergy with the previous narrative of individualism because if we believe the narrative that action has to happen at an individual level, and there are, according to this narrative, loads of other people who aren't taking any action yet, over one billion Chinese citizens who are apparently not making any change at all, 
then that's a very powerful disincentive to me taking any action, either over my own individual choices or in the way that I engage uh, with trying to fight for structural change. Um, and secondly, we've got this free riding idea. Um, and this appeals to the idea that um, taking action on climate change is unfair because others um, aren't going to act and then we're going to bear uh, over excessive costs and have very little impact. And so really at the heart of this idea of free riding is the assumption that tackling climate change has to cost us. And as we'll see throughout a range of other narratives, that's, I think, at the heart of most of these uh, narratives of delay and um, discourses of delay is this idea that climate action has to be costly, um, which I think is very much uh, a lie. And we're going we're to talk about that in a second. Um, and I guess overall, this narrative, again, presents this view of the world as uh, climate action is a zero sum game. We're going to have winners and losers. And if we act too soon, we're going to be the losers and others will win. And so it presents a global worldview, which is very competitive rather than collaborative. Um, and overall, I think both of these discourses around redirecting responsibility, they rely on an underlying narrative in which humans as individuals are at fault for their excessive consumption, and also that nations as a whole are in competition with one another rather than collaboration. And so what's missing in these narratives is any sense of, sort of communitarianism, or any sense of community and neighborliness, whether either at a local level, um, or at a global level. There's no sense of communities coming together to tackle climate change uh, and moving beyond the individual and moving beyond some sense of uh, international competition. If we move on to the next set of narratives, uh, we've got these ones around pushing non-transformative solutions. And in this first one around techno-optimism, I think this is the one, uh, uh, this is one of the two narratives that we see most clearly in current climate-focused debates particularly in places like the UK, which likes to position itself as a climate leader. Um, and this narrative is used to suggest that actually the problem isn't consumption, the problem isn't how we live, but it's just the technologies that we live with. If only we could get new technologies, we could keep living exactly as we are now, but we wouldn't have any impact on the planet. It's this idea that we can entirely decouple the way we live and the impact that that has on the planet through innovation. Now, I'm a big believer in innovation. I'm a big believer in the power of new technologies. My PhD is very much focused on that. Um, but I think it's very hard to argue that we can solve the climate crisis solely through technological optimism. And the reason for that is that, as we saw earlier, the rate at which we need to cut emissions in the next coming decades is so great that um, we can't rely solely on technology to do that. We are going to need to find new ways of being in the world. Um, and that's what techno-optimism pushes against. It pushes against any sense of climate action that involves people changing the way they live. Okay? Any, any sense of sacrifice, as this quote at the bottom shows, you know, um, a Tory minister saying, actually, we don't need to stop flying because we're going to get new types of planes that can be zero carbon. And therefore, you don't need to change the way that you live at all to save the planet. Um, and this techno-optimism, I guess, comes through in a couple of ways. So partly it's used to push climate action into the future to avoid any difficult decisions in the present. So um, saying, oh, look, we can't actually deal with all of climate change now. We need to wait and innovate more, get some new technologies, and maybe we'll be able to tackle it in the 2030s. Um, and again, it views people as uh, consumers who are unable or unwilling to change their lifestyles. It has this view of consumers as this sort of uh, Im implacable demand that you can only deal with through getting new technologies. We can't actually change the way that people live or the demands that people have. Um, and I see this example quite a lot in my own work, so particularly in North Kensington where I live. I'm quite involved in uh, campaigning for climate action here. And one of the big things that we're, uh, one of the sort of main areas of action here is around sustainable transport. You're bringing in low traffic neighborhoods. So actually trying to shift them, shift transport demands from uh, dependency and lock-in on cars towards public transport and active transport. And then we've got a really resistant council and MP who aren't resistant to climate action at all. They agree that the climate crisis is real. They agree that we need to take action. But they're unwilling to move anywhere beyond a sort of a belief in electric vehicles as the sole solution. 
Now, I'm a big fan of electric vehicles. They're going to be a big part of this. But actually, all the evidence shows that we need less cars as well as cleaner cars. Um, and the danger of a sort of uh, technology focused approach to climate action, which is pushed here, is that actually we believe that we can solve it entirely with technology and use that to dismiss alternative strategies such as great use of public transport and active transport. Um, and in doing so, we actually prevent ourselves being able to tackle the crisis um, at the scale and pace that we need. Um, if we go on to the next one, all talk, no action. Um, this has two sort of different parts of it. So first off, there's this um, focus on past successes without any sense of uh, how much more action is needed in the future. Um, I think you'll agree if we look at those first couple of slides and the rate at which carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere, any successes that we have had in the past, and we do have some successes to celebrate here in the UK and in other nations, it's very hard to make any case that, that they have done enough or that there are any real meaningful success compared with the scale of inaction and how little we've managed to achieve. Um, but you hear this all the time, you know, this quote at the bottom um, is a quote that appears in almost every government plan around climate action. Um, and it's, you know, every year it's, it's repeated with slightly different numbers around how since 1990 we've, we've you know, grown our GDP by at the moment 75% while cutting emissions by 43%. Um, and this is used as a sort of uh, a, a reason to justify this sort of false illusion of leadership and false illusion of success um, and it ignores the hard reality which is that while we have you know, cut our emissions at home by 43 percent when you count when you count for all the goods that we import as well and all the carbon that's released in making those goods we've actually only cut our emissions by about 15 percent since 1990 so it's a much smaller success when you account for all of the emissions that are related with our consumption. Um, but this stat is used over and over again um, in parliamentary questions, um, in uh, yeah, policy documents, in ministerial speeches to sort of create this sense that the UK is already leading and therefore doesn't need to make too many more hard decisions. Whereas the reality is, while the UK has had some successes, if we're really going to uh, walk the walk and contribute our fair share to climate action, we need to do a lot more and that's going to involve some hard decisions that need to be made. Um, as well as this sort of focus on the past successes, you also get this idea of targetism, um, where rather than actually focusing on what a level of action we have at the moment, which is very hard to argue is anything other than insufficient, there's a focus on the new targets and the future pledges. Um, and again, I see this a lot in uh, my work with the all party parliamentary group. So one of the things that we try and do is track government progress in tackling climate change, track their success at introducing new policies. Um, and it's really hard actually to tell when a policy is a new policy or just a reframing of an existing target um, in a new light. So for example, you know, the Conservatives uh, promised nine billion pounds uh, of funding for energy efficiency measures in homes in their manifesto. So nine billion pounds to make homes more energy efficient and save emissions. Um, and that fund has been announced, I think about four times now, you know, announced in the manifesto, announced as a policy document, announced when the competition was opened to, to apply for funding and announced when that funding was delivered. Now, I'm not, you know, I, I want to celebrate the fact that we're putting money into energy efficiency, but it's often quite hard to tell when there's actually a new and additional action happening on the ground and when there's just continued talk around the targets and uh, the future pledges that we're engaging in. And again, this builds this sort of false illusion of leadership, uh, which allows politicians to duck hard decisions. Uh, the third in the pushing non-transformative solutions that I want to look at briefly is this idea of uh, no sticks for just carrots. Um, and uh, this narrative you know, it, it acknowledges the need for action, but it preemptively rules out certain policy solutions. So anything which would restrict behavior um, is negative, and instead we should focus only on solutions which are voluntary or uh, supportive measures. And this is really problematic because the clear evidence is that we're doing quite well at incentivizing the good. If you look at the rate at which we're deploying renewable energy across the globe, it's accelerating really rapidly. You know, if you look at the level of sales of new 
electric vehicles, again, that curve is beginning to accelerate quite quickly. We're quite good at deploying the good. What we're really bad at is also phasing out the bad. And ultimately, what we need to do is get rid of fossil fuels. We need to focus on removing the bad as well as incentivizing the good. Um, and you see that quite a lot. For example, in the UK, um, there's been a big furore recently around whether the UK should introduce a new, uh, should allow a new coal mine to be built in Cumbria, to dig coal in Cumbria uh, in the future. And quite a lot of the um, arguments for this mine that have been made are around this idea of, well, we shouldn't be restricting the policy space. We shouldn't be restricting this coal mine. You know, if there's demand for coal in the UK, then we should build a coal mine and, and, and develop here. Uh, which, yeah, fails to acknowledge the fact that actually um, often demand can be supply driven and you know, if we dig the coal mine, then we'll be producing coal and there will be a market for it. Whereas if we don't dig the coal mine, um, then by restricting that supply of coal, we'll incentivize uh, new models and, and, and new ways of uh, new demand that, that uh, moves away from coal. Um, and so this is a, yeah, a, a, a really sort of unhelpful narrative i think because in reality we we need both sticks and pants and um, and again this narrative sort of as we as we've seen in quite a few of these discourses of delay they have a very particular view of what humans are and what citizens are you know and, and here again the public are painted as uh, a sort of mass body who are quite volatile and they're very unwilling to change and unwilling to accept any new way of being in the world um, and if anyone they applies policies which do, uh, if anyone you know, applies policies which restrict their freedoms or restrict their ability to live as they want, then there'll be a sort of large backlash. And um, rather than thinking about, well, how might we view humans and how might we create a society which is willing to change the way we live, is willing to forego certain activities for the good, uh, for the common good and for the good of the planet. Um, but this narrative suggests that that's you know, not possible. And rather than seeking to Think about how we might create you know, public willingness to forego certain activities. It uses this perception of the public as uh, unwilling to change and unwilling to accept new ways of being in the world um, as a justification for disregarding an entire suite of policies. Um, and you know, I've in my, my work with the All Party Parliamentary Group recently, we were we were hosting a, a, a cross-party roundtable around uh, the government's progress on climate action and what more needs to be done. And a particular policy came up, which we can talk about a little bit, called a frequent flyer levy. So the idea of this frequent flyer levy um, would be that actually we don't tax flights for the first flight. You know, everyone can have a flight which is tax free, but that we then have an escalating tax on future flights so that the people who are taxed most are not the general public, but the very small proportion of the public who take the majority of our flights. You know, in the UK, 15% of people take 70% of the flights. So the problem is not with people taking a single flight for their hot summer holidays. The problem is with people who are taking excessive numbers of flights in a single year. And so this would be a, a very progressive way of um, taxing those frequent flyers while uh, not uh, punishing those who are only flying a small amount. And this policy came up in our discussion and immediately the Tory, uh, the Conservative MP sort of dismissed this idea saying, oh, no, no, we, we don't want to tax hard working families. No, it's, it's not acceptable to, to do something like this. And this is not what the public want, despite clear polling evidence that actually this is what the public want. You know, a lot of people are very willing to have a frequent flyer levy that um, puts the burden, uh, puts the um, yeah, financial burden on those who fly excessively rather than on those who don't. Um, but you know, there just was no possibility of having a debate in this um, meeting that we had because it sort of shut down immediately as just not on the policy, uh, not on the table of possible policy approaches. Um, so that's uh, our sort of second um, set, which is around pushing non-transformative solutions. So acknowledging that we need to take action, but immediately restricting the policy space to just a small number of solutions, which really don't give us the toolbox that we really need to tackle climate change. Thirdly, we've got the a set of analysis which emphasize the downsides of climate action. Um, and this, in my opinion, is probably the most pernicious and most dangerous discourse, um, which is the argument that we need to act more slowly on climate change because of the costs of climate policy. 
So you see this quote at the bottom, you know, oh, well, we can't go faster because we can't just shut down business overnight. There's this inherent assumption that climate action has to either cost at the macroeconomic level, you know, it's to cost society as a whole, or also has to cost at an individual level, but it's hardworking families or people who are just about managing and who are going to be hit by climate action, and that that's therefore unfair and regressive. I think the most dangerous thing about this narrative, which I think has you know, really dominated discussion for decades, really, um, is the fact that it is plausible and it is somewhat believable. Um, and the, the reality is that you know, climate action could be incredibly costly and climate action could uh, have significant regressive impacts on, uh, poor, uh, you know, on, on poorer sections of society. You know, it's not inevitable. But what I would argue very strongly is that actually this narrative suggests that that's, that is inevitable, that climate action has to be costly at a macroeconomic and an individual level. And that is not the case. No, actually, the, the distribution and scale of the costs of climate action are not an a priori fact, but rather an outcome of policy design. And actually, by designing good policies, uh, we can actually uh, tackle climate change in a way that stimulates our economy, that actually makes us uh, more prosperous rather than uh, less well off, and also which um, tackles climate change in a way which is just and fair and doesn't excessively burden uh, all the sections of society. Um, so it, it's a lie that climate action has to be costly. There's very good evidence, and some of my PhD research focuses on this, very good evidence that actually we can tackle climate change in a way that makes us all better off um, rather than worse off. But that narrative is still sort of struggling to compete against this sort of implicit assumption that climate action is costly. And as we've seen back at the beginning, that then sort of there's these uh, toxic synergies between these different narratives. Because if we believe that climate action is costly, then that argument at the beginning around free riding and making sure that we're not sort of acting and bearing a burden while others are getting off scot free, that becomes much more powerful. Whereas if actually we think tackling climate change is going to benefit the UK regardless of what other people do, then that first narrative around that those narratives around free riding that we explored earlier lose a lot of their power because, well, why wouldn't we act anyway? It'll make us better off. Who cares if other people act or not? There's these, each of these narratives can reinforce one another. And that's why in some ways we need to tackle them all together. And um, the final one I just want to look at briefly is this idea of surrender. I think this is a really strong narrative, pardon me, is, is a very strong narrative, particularly that prevents people from taking action in the first place. So I think a lot of people are uh, don't engage with climate change and don't uh, seek to act on climate change because they're not necessarily convinced that change is possible in the first place. Um, and if change is not possible, then confronting the horrific reality of the climate crisis is terrifying and disempowering. Um, and fear is not an effective motivator for action. I really don't believe that fear is an effective motivator for action. I think grief might be a very effective motivator. Grief that leads to hope, yes, but fear is not is a very uh, effective, uh, disempowering force. And again, I think there's a very pernicious link between this narrative and the others that we've explored. Because if the other narratives that we've been looking at are true, you know, if if climate action really is very costly and people really are unwilling to change their consumption patterns at all and if everyone needs to act together and many people are just going to you know many people or nations are not going to take any action then there really is no hope but what i would suggest is that this final narrative is flawed because the narratives on which it's predicated on these previous discourses that we booked at they are also flawed um, and they do not necessarily have to be the way that the world is. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, another of our narratives. So that's a sort of whistle-stop tour of some of the narratives and some of the discourses of delay that I think I see at, yeah, I see action in uh, politics as I'm working uh, in the run-up to COP26. Um, and I also see in my individual life as I engage in activism and meet people and talk to them about climate change. I think these narratives are very much still alive and well um, and if we are going to bend the curve at the pace that we need we really need to confront these discourses of delay so how do we do that um, i'm going to give a couple of brief suggestions and then i'll be really happy to 
uh, discuss more broadly. So I think the first thing is sort of building on, continuing on this sort of narrative understanding of climate delay. If there's an existing set of narratives which have very effectively been used to uh, justify inaction on climate change or insufficient action on climate change, we need an alternative set of discourses, you know, the discourses of action that we can use to replace this narrative. Um, so on this slide, I've just sort of suggested some of those underlying narratives that I think we see in the discourses of delay. And I suggested a set of underlying narratives that we could use to confront that, uh, those, those arguments. Because um, I think you know, it's really important that we don't just uh, sort of try and dismantle and uh, yeah, uh, analyze the existing narratives, but we actually need to provide a new and compelling narrative that, that people can live in instead. And we, we always need to live in a story. And so the best way to tackle with an existing story that is leading to some form of injustice or um, oppression is to, 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 to speak and to live a new narrative. Um, that can disrupt and overtake that existing narrative. So if we just look through these, you know, first off, I think these, the discourses of delay often uh, present individuals and nations as isolated competitors. So both it, both the narrative around individualism or whataboutism or free riding, all of them at their heart suggests that we're isolated individual consumers and that. Uh, the way that nations relate to one another is through competition and dominance rather than collaboration. If we can build an alternative narrative that's centered on the Christian ethic of neighborliness, both at that local level and at a global level, I think that will be really helpful in disrupting those first set of narratives. So I think both, you know, I think that, that needs to happen at both a local and a global level. So locally, actually, we need to acknowledge that, uh, particularly you know, in the UK over the last 30 to 50 years, we've had you know, a huge decline in public institutions and the concept of neighbourliness, and we have become a much more isolated and fragmented society. And the more that we can rebuild those connections with those around us, uh, the more that we can develop a new way of living that is much more in touch with our local environment and with those that we live around. Um, and that, I think, will be really helpful actually in breaking some of these uh, patterns of consumption in our lives that are reinforced by the wider structures that we live in. Um, I think um, there's a, you know, a whole range of examples of locally led solutions that um, can tackle excessive consumption through the sharing economy, um, through the richness that we get through local interactions that um, can sort of be a really effective uh, antidote to uh, the sense that we need to consume more, which is engendered in us by advertising and uh, other influences in the wider system. So I think neighbourliness is a really important narrative to, to disrupt the idea that we're isolated and that we're competitors at all times. We can be neighbours and we can be citizens together. Um, secondly, I think these narratives often portray humans as greedy and that we're first and foremost a consumer. A lot of policy documents talk about consumers rather than talking about citizens. Um, and I think this ties in with, again, the narratives around individualism, around the need to use carrots rather than sticks, and also around the idea of techno optimism that we can't change the way we live, and so we have to rely on future technologies. Um, but if we could disrupt that and instead tell a story which has a positive view of humanity, you know, human beings which are capable of sacrifice, uh, which are concerned with connection with one another on the planet um, and with the common good, and who are first and foremost responsible citizens rather than greedy consumers, I think. That will really help us uh, tackle and dismantle some of those narratives. Third up, rather than positioning ourselves as false leaders and having a false sense of our own success, uh, we need to you know, acknowledge that we're not doing enough at the moment and be willing to be humble and to repent um, and to acknowledge the reality that you know, we, we really haven't done enough in the past 30 years. Um, and I just see so little of this humility and repentance from our, our politicians at, at any level. And, um, you know, we can talk, there's lots of reasons maybe for why that is the case, but actually, I, I think it would be a really compelling narrative if, if the government of the day was willing to say, look, we, we haven't done enough collectively as a society over the last 30 years. And not, 
promote this false sense of success, but be willing to acknowledge that. Um, and from that place, be willing to uh, make some more hard decisions in the future. Fourthly, these narratives inherently believe that climate action is a negative thing, that it's going to cost us, that the only benefit we get out of it is some change in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, and that overall there has to be a costly action. Um, and I think that's the one that we really need to tackle the most. And we need to tackle that by acknowledging that actually in reality, climate change is going to make our lives a whole lot better. And that's for a range of reasons that um, I'll just briefly run through. The first and most obvious is that actually if we don't tackle climate change, the impacts are going to be world shattering. There's going to be hugely devastating impacts across the world, you know, most heavily felt by the global poor. Um, but it will impact on all of our lives in a negative way. And so avoiding those climate damages is going to be is going to make our lives a lot better. But secondly, there's this idea of co-benefits, which is the idea that actually a lot of the actions that we need to take to tackle climate change will bring lots of additional benefits. So for example, insulating our houses will deal with the issue of fuel poverty. You know, still um, in Scotland, for example, 35% of households uh, are living in fuel poverty. We can tackle climate change through a mass energy efficiency retrofitting scheme, then actually we can also tackle the issue of fuel poverty in the UK, which would be really great. You know, equally, you know, moving away from um, fossil fuels in, in our cars towards electric vehicles and active and public transport is going to you know, reduce the air pollution, which kills tens of thousands of people in the UK every year. Changing the way we eat to more low carbon foods is going to make us healthier. Um, Shifting the way that we work uh, from a sort of relentless cycle of consumption and production can make more space for leisure and more space for connection with nature and connection with one another, which we've seen so much in the last year is so important for us. Um, and I think we need to paint this positive picture of climate action. You know, um, Ed Miliband says, and I think it's a really, really helpful saying, he says, look, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. And, and actually, the, the reality is that climate action can make all of our lives better. We can live uh, in cleaner, more healthy, uh, more prosperous cities because we've taken action on climate change. Um, and we need, to, we need to tell that story and live in it. And finally, this, uh, these narratives which lead to maybe a sense of doomism or a lack of agency, that change is impossible, that there's nothing that we can do. We need to tell a different story, a story that you know, starts with grief that acknowledges that we have lost so much and we will lose more from climate change, but moves from that place of grief into a place of hope, into a place that says, well, we still need to act for all that we can still save, for all that still can be saved, we need to act. Um, and a sense of responsibility that says, you know, actually, regardless of whether we think we can win this battle or not, our responsibility as global citizens, as and for us who are Christians as followers of Jesus, it uh, means that we need to act regardless if we're not totally sure of whether we're going to be able to win or not. So I think you know, if we can tell this alternative story around neighbor, na neighborliness, responsible citizenship, you know, the values of humility and repentance, the fact that climate action doesn't have to be costly, but can actually make all of our lives better. And if we can journey together through a place of grief, through towards hope and responsibility. I think that will set us up actually as individuals and as a, and as a society to be much more resistant to these uh, discourses of delay. I think a couple of things I'd want to say here, you know, these narratives, they might seem at points idealistic and naive, um, but what I'd suggest is that these narratives are still contested narratives. You know, either set of these narratives could end up being the reality and there is an extent to which they can be self-fulfilling. Um, you know, we we could live it. We could live in a world in which, as humans, we are reduced to simply being sort of greedy consumers, ever looking for the next thing. But that doesn't have to be the case. And we could end up in a world where we are responsible citizens and where we have a sense of global connectedness. But that won't just happen by accident. These are contested narratives, and so I think one of the key roles for us. Um, as individuals who are concerned with climate action is to try and speak that new reality, that new narrative into being um, in the sort of, yeah, the, the, following the sort of idea from Walter Brueggemann of the prophetic imagination, you know, we need to 
conceive of this new way of being in the world and speak it into being and also live it into being. You know, it's not these this alternative set of narratives, I don't think they'll just become true overnight. It'll only become true if we make it true. And we make it true by living like it's true. That's the first thing I think we need to do, provide a new and compelling narrative. Um, secondly, and briefly, uh, we need to also confront those vested interests who currently own the story. You know, we need to acknowledge that in our democracy at the moment, there are deficiencies, which means that some of the vested interests who would like to uh, promote and, uh, and share these discourses of delay have access to politicians in a way that um, everyday citizens don't. And that means that these discourses of delay are often amplified in the corridors of power and are ringing very loudly. And so we need to find other ways to get alternative narratives um, up to the ears of politicians and confront these vested interests. And there's a whole range of ways that we could do that. Um, but one of the ways that I've been involved in that I think is really important, which I'm going to talk briefly about, is deliberative democracy. So you might be familiar with this deliberative democracy. There's a range of different approaches that can can um, it can take the form of, but one of the most common is this idea of a citizens' assembly. So a citizens' assembly is where you get a, a group of citizens together who are representative of the population as a whole, and you, you get them together to be educated about, to learn about a particular issue, to then deliberate and discuss with one another on this issue, and then to make recommendations in relation to it. And last year we had uh, our first citizens' assembly on climate change, the climate assembly, um, which uh, ran over four different weekends and had um, 110 people from the UK across across the country uh, engaged in it. And I think the this is really important to talk about because if we go back to that initial those initial two figures I showed you, and the second of those, uh, with which shows the the rate at which we need to cut emissions in the next 10 to 20 years if we really want to tackle climate change. There are some in the climate movement who would say the only way to do that is to sort of move to a war footing to restrict uh, individuals' rights and you know maybe actually democracy as a tool is just not capable of dealing with the rate of change that we need and we need to you know, reduce the level of democracy we have and, and have more of a level of sort of government from above just to make the decisions that we need. Uh, and my argument would be that uh, for a range of reasons, we need more democracy rather than less in tackling climate change. And that's for a range of reasons. So um, a few here. So the first is that I think more democracy and deliberative democracy, which gives people sort of a chance to think about the issues and, and have the information and resources to learn about them, that can really help demonstrate a specific mandate for climate action. We need to acknowledge that you know, a vote is a very blunt instrument. Um, and it's very hard to go from uh, voting patterns to demonstrate specific mandate for particular climate actions. Um, but through deliberative democracy, we can build a much better picture of what it is that the public want. And the climate assembly from last year showed that actually if you get groups of citizens together and you give them the time and you allow them to engage with one another, they actually come out with very ambitious proposals. You know, for example, the citizens assembly uh, came out very strongly in favour of a frequent flyer tax, um, which, as we saw earlier, some MPs would write off as, oh no, that's not what the public want. But actually, through deliberative democracy, we can show, well, actually, a representative sample of the UK, when given the chance to think about this, came out very strongly in favour of this. And so you can demonstrate these specific mandates. I think, secondly, this is really important because it gets people in the room with politicians. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you know, actually, in, in our democracy, we do have deficiencies where certain people are able to access the corridors of power and share their narratives uh, very loudly and others are locked down. And so I think it's really important that uh, we ensure that citizens, people are at the table as we're designing climate policy and that can help allow these new narratives to emerge. And as, as an example there, um, I was following the climate assembly quite closely last year. It's really interesting to see the way that people engaged and, and some of those narratives that we've seen earlier, particularly the ones that talk about the way humans are, that we are sort of inherently and inevitably uh, greedy consumers, that we're un unable or unwilling to sacrifice. That was really heavily challenged by the Citizens Assembly. You, know, you saw people uh, engaging, you know, people who would have 
uh, previously maybe gone on six to seven foreign holidays a year, all by plane. You know, being confronted with the reality of the climate crisis, being confronted with the reality of our interconnected world and the way that their lifestyle is impacting on people around the world, being willing to change, being willing to say, well, okay, maybe I'm going to really cut down on my holidays. Maybe I'm going to be willing to promote this tax, which I know will you know, hit me harder than other people, but actually I, I'm invested in this and I have a sense of neighborliness and connection that leads me to this. And I, I'd really recommend if you have a, a chance, if you've got an hour to watch The People Versus Climate Change, which is a documentary about the Citizens Assembly. Um, it's on the BBC, The People Versus Climate Change. And it's very moving because you see in it that some of these narratives that are promoted around the way people are and what people want are actually quite misleading and often quite false. Um, and actually, if you do bring people together and allow them the chance to uh, be confronted by other people to do this together as a group, actually people are, are capable of much more generosity of spirit and much more um, self-sacrifice than you might otherwise presume. And thirdly, I think it's really important that we we have more democracy rather than less because actually climate action is going to require changes to the way that we live and you know, we can't do climate policy by stealth just sort of sneaking in from above and um, people's lives will change because we're tackling climate change and so it's really important that people are involved and prepared and at the center of this um, so i think you know deliberative democracy is a really powerful tool i was uh, involved in the citizens assembly in brent council uh, quite a few councils have used their own ones um, and again there I, I really saw sort of individuals journeying through some of those narratives of and discourses of delay towards these discourses of action so for example there's you know a really widespread and very justifiable concern around the cost of climate policy you know people saying well i can't even afford you know i i, I can't afford a second hand petrol car you know, I don't have 500 pounds spare. So you know, if we all have to move to electric vehicles, they cost huge amounts. I'm not going to be able to afford them. Similarly around the, you know, an air source heat pump or energy efficiency. And you're able to sort of journey with these people and explore their fears, explore their concerns, but also explore the fact that you know, that doesn't have to be inevitable. Absolutely, if you know, the council or the government wants to do climate policy in a way that is regressive and hits the poorest households the hardest, then we should be campaigning against it, then we should be speaking up against it. But actually, to journey with these people uh, through that sort of fear and scepticism of climate action towards the place where they said, well, no, I, I do want an electric vehicle, I do want an air source heat pump. I acknowledge that I can't afford these, and so therefore there has to be some financial support from the local government or central government. But I will be a voice for climate action rather than against it, despite my concerns because I've sort of journeyed through from one set of narratives to an alternative, much more positive and empowering set of motives. And so I think you know, ultimately the way that we dismantle the existing discourses um, and create new ones is through conversation and through connection. And so I think deliberative democracy is a really important part of this. But ultimately, obviously, the Citizens Assembly was only 100 citizens from the UK, and a lot of people weren't engaged in it. Um, and so there's a real question of, okay, how do we extend this idea of the power of conversation and the power of connection across the, the rest of the public? Because you know, it's deliberation and conversation that drove change for some of these individuals. But if you don't have that deliberation and you don't have that change, then many people who end up sort of trapped in their current narratives, which are reinforced on them by those vested interests who would want to benefit from it. As we've gone through, and as you were maybe reading the paper or the comic, you'll have seen some of the examples of the discourses of delay. And you know, a lot of them are promulgated by oil and gas companies or by particular media outlets who are owned by people who would uh, have an interest in delaying or deterring climate action. And we need to, again, going back to those narratives that we're looking at here, you know, there's a lot of existing influence on individuals to. Uh, support those first set of narratives that would uh, disincentivize climate action and so the question is well how do we how do we make space and connection with individuals for these new narratives to, to take place you know i think deliberative democracy is a really important and exciting example and i'd like to see that rolled out 
not just at a national level, but as a local level and even maybe at a ward level. Um, but to acknowledge that that's uh, never going to manage to reach everyone and there are resource constraints on that. Then I guess there's also a question of what do we do as individuals? This is where I want to sort of land and say that as individuals, our call as people who are concerned about climate action um, and as followers of Jesus is to be messengers of an alternative reality, both in word and in action. You know, our voice and the way that we live is the most threatening agent to empire. Um, and it's by sustaining and supporting these alternative narratives that we've looked briefly at, that we can resist the existing narratives that support and justify a system that is full of climate delay and climate inaction. Um, and I don't think we need to be experts in climate policy to do this. Um, I think we are able to confront the underlying narratives and build this alternative narrative without, we don't need to know all the facts about climate action. Um, and this alternative narrative is one that I think is really strongly aligned with that kingdom narrative embodied by Jesus. I think if we do that, we can make some really good headroom.